This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday edition. Today we're talking with Alec Todd of Indie Coffee Roasters. Well, hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show. Hope you're having an amazing day today. And uh, welcome to another Founder Friday episode where we uh, sit down with founders, some of the nation's best coffee shops, and talk to them about their journey and uh, what they learned along the way and some lessons that we can apply to our own journey, um, especially if you're in that uh, position of eventually opening up your own coffee shop or you're currently an owner and want to learn more about other people's experiences to help motivate you and uh, give you some insights. These are perfect episodes for that. So I'm excited to talk with Alec Todd today. Wonderful shop in Indianapolis, Indie Coffee Roasters. And uh, we're going to be focusing a lot on the kind of transitions that he has been making in the course of uh, going from a, a roaster, like a basically a home roaster to a commercial roaster to professional roasting and a, a shop. And there's just a whole lot of changes that have happened recently. And we're diving deep into this subject with him today as we discover the story of Indie Coffee Roasters. So uh, yeah, this is going to be a great episode. Now, Keys to the Shop is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee, of course, is one of the world's best specialty coffee equipment suppliers. They are literally world-renowned for curating the best coffee equipment to suit whatever situation you might find yourself in, Uh, whether that's uh, outfitting your home bar or outfitting your commercial coffee bar. If you're in the market for commercial coffee equipment like espresso machines, grinders, brewers, and things like that, they can help you out, but they can also help you out with um, large-scale equipment such as under-counter refrigeration. So it it runs the gamut, and uh, they do such a great job. Uh, Visit their website, prima-coffee.com, to get an idea of what I'm talking about because there you will find... Not only do they have an amazing selection, not only is it a beautiful website, but it's also chock full of amazing resources, um, blogs, videos to help you learn how to not only make great coffee, but use the equipment of making coffee well. So uh, these guys are just all about helping you succeed in coffee, and I love them for it. So I would encourage you, go to prima-coffee.com, reach out to them and let them know that you heard about them here at Keys to the Shop. And thank you so much, Prima, for your support of Keys to the Shop. This episode of Founder Friday is also brought to you by the Pacific Barista Series. These are the uh, line of plant-based performance beverages that are designed specifically to match the standards for excellence that baristas demand. They were actually designed in tandem with professional baristas, bench tested by people who work day in and day out in cafes to make sure that whether you're using the um, you know almond, soy, coconut, or rice, or whatever you use, you are going to be experiencing a texture that can create latte art, something that stands up to the heat from steaming and keeps the flavor of your beverage focused on coffee. Um, They're just a joy to use. And Pacific has been a longtime supporter of the barista and coffee community globally. These products are just a testimony to the fact that they are dedicated to excellence and serving their community well. So I would encourage you to go to pacificfoods.com, look into the barista series line of plant-based performance beverages for your shop. Thank you so much, Pacific, for your support of Keys to the Shop. All right, so today we are going to be talking to Alec Todd of Indie Coffee Roasters, Indianapolis, Indiana. Alec had started out as a home roaster and eventually started selling his coffee and kind of graduated from there into a larger roaster. And from there, he took on partners and opened a coffee shop, and it's a beautiful shop in Indianapolis. The company was founded back in 2013, and in the last couple of years, they've been operating their new retail location and roastery in Indianapolis. And this conversation with Alec focuses specifically on the transitions that um, were made to go from a home roaster who started selling his coffee to taking on investors and partners and growing the company and all of the points in between that uh, an owner goes through in 
you know, relinquishing responsibility, scaling experience, um, making decisions, and uh, just a lot of things at play when you go from home roaster to, you know, commercial roaster with a retail space. And that's what this conversation is all about. And we get to learn the story of indie coffee roasters along the way. I was uh, honored to be a guest on Alex's podcast over at uh, Coffee Uncut. You should subscribe. You should uh, go subscribe to that podcast as well. Now it's an honor to get to learn his story here at Keys to the Shop. And I, I think that the uh, conversation is going to be chock full of a lot of insights that will help you if you're in that position of kind of changing your business a little bit, scaling it, uh, maybe you have questions about what it's like to take on investors um, or what kind of emotions a person goes through or um, what kind of preparation do you need to go through in order to give up some of your responsibility as an owner and find yourself uh, useful in new ways? These are some of the things that we're going to be talking about in this conversation and more. And uh, Alec is just really well spoken, and I know you're going to get so much out of this. So uh, without further ado from me, let's get to our conversation with the founder of Indie Coffee Roasters, Alec Todd. Well, Alec, welcome to Keys to the Shop. Really glad to be talking to you today. Yeah, excited to be here. Um, always, uh, always pumped to be on the other side of the mic uh, and uh, and and partner with y'all. Yeah, it's nice talking to another uh, a fellow podcaster, and um, I was excited to be a guest on your show. And I'm definitely excited to jump into uh, our discussion today uh, on on just exploring how things have come about for you and your, not just your career, but your, your brand and, uh, kind of focusing on, you know, how life is at the transition points, which you've gone through so many Mm -hmm. in the last few years. And those are the critical moments in a business's life for sure. So, um, I, I wonder maybe we just start at the beginning. Of course, that's a great place to start where, uh, you got uh, your coffee journey started. Um, you know, it wasn't barista work necessarily. It was a uh, roasting, right? Yeah. So, uh, I don't take the highly traditional track as far as a uh, cafe owner. You know, I didn't spend, um, much of my life, uh, working professionally in coffee, but, um, always had a passion as a coffee consumer um, and, uh, and had a huge passion for what coffee meant to me and what coffee meant to other people. Um, I really started, uh, follow, falling in love with coffee, with, uh, brewing, uh, and, uh, making coffee at home. Uh, and the science behind that really just got me my, uh, my wheels turning and, and spent a lot of time learning through that. And then, uh, it actually was um, Thanksgiving time of 2013 that um, I went into a local cafe here in Indianapolis um, that uh, I wanted to do a little coffee tasting at our family Thanksgiving. Um, and so I asked them if they had any sample bags or like small bags of coffee. Uh, and he was like, yeah, I can put some together for you. And um, so did that. And then he asked um you know, I, he, he, he told me, you know, I got started this way. Have you ever thought about roasting coffee? Um, and I said, what does that mean? Number one. Um, uh-huh. and, uh, and number two, uh, I didn't, uh, you know, I thought, you know, that was some magical thing that only large companies were able to accomplish and, you know, isn't really accessible. Um, and he let me know, Hey, you know, with, uh, well, with a whirly pop popcorn, uh, machine or maker and, um, and uh, a little bit of uh, propane gas for a gas stove, um, you can get started. So uh, he uh, he gave me um, about a pound or so of, of raw green coffee, which was the first time I'd ever seen uh, coffee in its raw form. Um, and then I asked my wife, uh, Jenny, who is also uh, now our director of brand and marketing and, and a co-owner here at ICR, I asked her for uh, some seed money. Uh, with a quick uh, turnaround to say that I was going to pay it back. Um, so I took uh, the $50 seed money that she she gave us and, and bought that equipment and then uh, and roasted our first batch uh, out on the patio in 
uh, December of 2013. So, wow. um, that, that was the very beginning of, uh, of sort of the roasting journey and, and then what is now Indie Coffee Roaster. So, boy, that's, uh, definitely a grassroots way to, to start a business. And, uh, yeah. how quickly did you make your 50 back by the way? <laughs> uh, it took me uh, a little under a month. Um, I, uh, I let her know that I really wanted to move that quick. So I got about two to three pounds, uh, four pounds or so of coffee out of that, uh, and then, uh, sold it pretty quickly and, and was able to, uh, get out from underneath my initial investment. So, um, it was important to do that, but, um, yeah, all fun and games, <laughs> but, um, nice. but cool too. Black. Yep. So how long was it that you st- were roasting, um, before you started the, um, the way we know indie coffee roasters now, how many years mm-hmm. were you just, um, building the roasting company? Yeah. So, uh, it was soon after that, um, I was, I was managing, uh, in retail. I was actually working in a retail environment and managing, uh, their back end inventory. Um, and, uh, I had the awesome opportunity to share my coffee initially with a lot of my coworkers there. And, uh, they started to support and, and sort of fall in love with me, uh, and the coffee side and, um, uh, cool sort of side note with that. Um, my first customer, um, when, when it was just me, my first customer, uh, that bought the first bag of coffee, uh, actually was able to, uh, come and buy one of the first cups of coffee at our, uh, retail space, uh, uh which was, uh, which is a really cool uh, moment, but that's obviously sort of a side note. Um, but yeah, so I spent, uh, I, we built out the brand and sort of the idea uh, pretty quickly in 2013 and just said, uh, hey, we probably should not, you know, sell people coffee in little plastic bags uh, with no uh, wording or inscription on it. Uh, so let's uh, come up with a brand and, a, and an idea. Um, and we always loved Indiana, Indianapolis. That was always at the core of, of sort of home for us. And we had recently moved back. Um, we named our, our dog, uh, Indy. Um, and, uh, so when we were thinking through coffee roasting, we said, well, uh, we love the idea of Indy, but don't want to be too obvious. And we love the idea of independent. Um, and so that's where the marriage of I N D I E, uh, Indy coffee roasters came from. And, um, yeah, so uh, and then the dog just sort of took a life of its own. Uh, we looked around for um, other coffee companies that had dachshunds uh, in their logo, and, and there really wasn't any at the time. Um, so we very quickly uh, jumped on that, and, and my wife built a, a brand structure out of that and uh, obviously grown from there. But um, that was that was really the birth of the whole idea. And then uh, I spent um, most of 2014, uh, 15, and 16 – uh, just small batch roasting. Uh, so the whirly pop was, uh, graduated from that pretty quickly. Um, and not the most efficient way to, uh, to roast consistent coffee. Uh, but I did have the opportunity to roast with a friend of mine, um, on his, uh, 1905, uh, Royal number no. five. So still there, very manual oriented, uh, no real gauges, anything right. like that. Manual cooling tray. Um, So I say all of that because, uh, and we've spoken on this on on another podcast, but I've always felt it's important to, uh, I call it roasting blind almost. Um, if, if I'm training a roaster or, or to be a part of our company, uh, I always uh, make them roast initially without any technology involved, uh, because I want them to trust their senses first. Uh, and be in tune with the coffee and then, and then let the, let the, uh, technology and all of that, uh, sort of marry together with that. But, um, that was where I started. So my, uh, my eyes, my ears, my nose, uh, were highly fine tuned because that was the only tools that, that I really had to my disposal, um, to really understand, uh, quality and consistency. Um, so continue to do that and continue to just do really small batch stuff and, um, little markets here and there and little events here and there from awesome people that supported. Uh, we, uh, pretty soon after that, we're able to partner with the local brewery that we're still partners with today, uh, to develop a, a coffee, uh, blonde. So they developed a, uh, a coffee using our, our whole beans and then cold brew and all of that. Um, 
So they partnered with us early on. Uh, we're, we're involved in some bakeries and other things like that uh, early on as well. Um, and then it wasn't, uh, it wasn't until 2017 that, um, everything changed uh, from there. So, Mm. so when you're making all of these transitions from the Whirly Pop roaster to the Royal uh, cast iron roaster, the, Mm -hmm. to, you know, taking on clients, what is going through your mind at this time as you're growing the business? Is this is mm-hmm. this part of your plan when you started out and, and realized that you wanted to, obviously you wanted to grow this thing, but yep. to what degree and, and sure. what was your mentality through all of this? Was it kind of a, a challenge to to take on these extra uh, these extra responsibilities that mm. would nece- necessarily kind of pull you away from roasting a little bit as you go? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the whole idea initially was for me to uh, continue to pursue the career that I was involved in, uh, which I was in pastoral ministry before, uh, before now. Um, so always to pursue that as, as sort of my career path, um, and coffee and coffee roasting and really any coffee roasters in general, uh, was just a way to, um, supply uh, me personally with coffee, um, uh, and, uh, and allow me to have great coffee, uh, to be able to drink as well as uh, some cash to purchase, uh, brewing equipment or, or things like that. So, uh, we were every year we were at, uh, a flat line zero, um, early on. So, uh, and the reason that I did that, um, was, uh, I wanted to keep, uh, Indie Coffee Roasters a hobby. Uh, I wanted to keep it something that I wasn't concerned about making money for because it wasn't necessarily my main focus. So I wanted it always to be a, a, an outlet and an opportunity for that. Um, so, uh, as I started to make transitions from different areas, um, the whole idea was still continually on that path of, um, you know, just growing it in that way and, and growing it pretty low key. Um, you know, all these different transition periods, um, I always, uh, continued to, um, to make sure that I was, uh, really romanticizing or thinking through, uh, how lucky we were to even have people, uh, partnering with us. So when I fold my, sold my first bag, uh, made sure and sort of soaked in that moment, um, that, you know, Hey, this is someone that trusted me with their hard earned money to give them a product. And, and then I was able to provide that to them. And, and then the same goes for the first event we ever did. Um, just how honored we were to uh, have people be able to enjoy our coffee, uh, in a brood aspect and, and be able to interact with us. Um, and just the support that comes with that. Uh, and then obviously the partnership we were able to start, uh, with, uh, the brewery companies called four day Ray, a current wholesale partner. Um, and, uh, and, begin that relationship and the whole trust that goes with that, um, continually, um, always keeping the current why at that point at the front of our mind, which was, um, you know, we want to create a great product for people to enjoy, but ultimately allow it to be a continual outlet for, uh, for me and, and, uh, and for our family and, and all of that. So, uh, that was always the focus, um, earlier on. And, um, and then focus continued to shift and change uh, as it became a little bit more of a reality. So, was there any point at which you, I mean, you were talking about soaking up the moment and you know, always romanticizing those types of moments that come up in in the business as it, you know, changes over time? Are there things that you just had to like mourn the loss of mm. that you know you really couldn't hang on to? Yeah, um, yeah, I think. Uh, in, in other transition moments, uh, there's always that time, but I mean, uh, when we, uh, lost our first wholesale client, uh, you know, not our first wholesale client, but just our first client that, that stepped down from partnering with us, uh, that was hard. Uh, you know, uh, you always have the retrospect of feeling like you did something wrong or, um, or something like that. Uh, and obviously the more you're in the, in the business, you realize that uh, it's just business. It's not personal and, um, and things like that happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was definitely a time that, uh, you had to sort of check and and understand, you know, where did I fall short or, 
or maybe I didn't fall short, but uh, it just had to be a, a decision that was made, and uh, and that's how how things had to roll. But um, yeah, I mean that uh, that was always something that uh, that was tough to handle. Um, and then obviously, you know, fast forwarding a little bit, um, our our motives. Our motives heavily changed uh, when uh, we were able to uh, partner with our uh, our co-owners now, um, who are the two people that believe in my wife and I. I think more than anybody out there. Uh, there's an argument for that. Obviously, we have our parents and everybody else, but <laughs> um, but uh, they're definitely two people that. Uh, that believe in us and believe in uh, what Indie Coffee Roasters in a, is, I think, more than anybody. Uh, and it was because of that belief uh, when we were just a uh, roasting company that was doing things very low key on the side. Uh, it was that belief then that showed me that they really believed in us and uh, and why making the transition to uh, giving up ownership into our company, not giving up, but, uh, you know, I don't like that word, but, uh, partnering alongside, yeah, uh, people yeah. that were, that were also bringing a lot to the table as well. Uh, but, uh, the biggest thing that, uh, they brought to the table was that genuine belief, uh, in us and, and, and what could, could be. Um, so after spending those few years, uh, on my own and, and then, uh, and then, uh, partnering with them in, in March of, uh, 2017, um, we all four decided that, Hey, you know, we're going to run after this thing together. Um, uh, and, uh, and we each, uh, each four of our, our co-owners partners, it's my wife and I, and then another couple, um, which, uh, a lot of people say that we're crazy for, uh, for partnering, uh, together. Uh, but we, we've always believed that, um, uh, it's our relationship and, and that partnership together, uh, that's the most valuable thing to us. And the company is just a, a product of that. Um, so that partnership, uh, has continued to grow and develop over time. And, you know, we've obviously had our hard times and ups and downs and things like that, but, um, you know, it, it's that belief and, and strength that comes from my wife and, and from, uh, Diane and Kevin that, um, that allow us to continue to move forward. And, um, so yeah, that, that transition period, um, was, uh, was a, a definite learning curve. Um, we stepped into, uh, this idea of, of me moving into this, uh, full time, uh, and our owners sort of doing this full time and being our main focus, me stepping away from my uh, career in ministry and moving into this, uh, this new chapter, uh, and realizing that there was potential there. I think the, the reason I always wanted it to be a hobby was that I, I never felt like it was a reality, uh, to, to make it something, uh, full time. And, and, uh, it was because of Jenny and, and Kevin and Diane that they, you know, believed and believed in it. Uh, and we're willing to take the risk together. And, um, that's why we were able to take that leap and, uh, and make it our, make it our main focus. So, um, that was, uh, the, the year of what we call sort of the year of risk, I guess was, uh, 2017, <laughs> um, uh, risk and change. So, um, yeah. So in, in terms of, uh, the relationship now, you, you know, you've just described exactly why you decided to join together, share ownership mm -hmm. and, uh, take, take, uh, Diane and Kevin on this journey that you and your wife already were on. Um, in those years beforehand though, you were also approached by other people and other opportunities, I imagine. Mm hmm yeah, I don't really know. Um, you know, I don't under hundred percent know why. Uh, but, um, we just felt again, that support and that, uh, connection with them. We'd been friends with them for, for a good amount of time. Um, and, uh, and I think it was that just, uh, you could hear it in their voice that they believed in us. And they also believed that this was going to be, a big thing. And they had that drive to do that. Um, 
it wasn't just a thing they wanted to do for fun or, or, or whatever. It was something that they wanted to see uh, really grow and, and build into something. And uh, that's really important for, for me um, is to continually partner with people that, that have that passion and drive. And um, it's a lot of why I, I married my wife uh, is she's very passionate and, and driven. Um, and, uh, and that's what made it, I think, a reality for uh, the, uh, for us four as owners to be able to come together um, and, uh, and gel the way that we have, um, over the last two and a half years. So, okay. So when you're looking at your company now, um, obviously anybody discovering your brand for the first time, uh, sees it in the form that it is now. And now mm-hmm. we've discussed the history of the brand and how it yeah. came to be you yourself, um, now taking on, uh, partners when, you really just wanted it to be a hobby, but you have mm-hmm. this, um, you know, vague is not the right word, but the uh, uh, an overarching principle of continual growth or being, yep. you know, moving forward and, and et cetera. Yep. Um, there has to be a, a point at which you say, this is actually where we want to go. The point of mm-hmm. when we get there, we're going to know that we arrived and not just like say, generally, we just want to get better because you can't really yeah. spend money on generalities. <laughs> you yeah. know? So what was the process like at that point um, when you took on partners and then decided, okay, we're going to uh, basically you know, exit the chrysalis, you know, having been a caterpillar and then yeah, uh, yeah, turn yeah. into this butterfly. Like what did you, uh, what, what was the process like of allocating money, making decisions yeah. on what to get, et cetera? Yeah. Um, so we made a huge point, uh, even, even very early on, uh, I, ca- I came on like a- officially, you know, quitting my previous job and whatnot. And, uh, we, we came together to work 40 hours a week, uh, in June of 17. Um, and, uh, it was at that point that we started doing uh, monthly, you know, partners meetings. It was, I mean, we were meeting obviously throughout that time working together, but official, uh, meetings together with us four where we could sit down and bring up concerns or, or develop things or do, you know, bring up issues or, or whatever. And, uh, and it was that structure, I think that helped really set us up for success, uh, because we knew that we were going to protect that time, uh, and have hard conversations, uh, not let things fester or, uh, or get in the way. Um, but understand that all four of us are highly passionate about, uh, what we're running toward, um, and we all have to be on the same page together to continue to run toward, toward that. Uh, and when you're starting out in a partnership together, um, you know, communication is the most important thing. Um, so even before, you know, construction and picking out equipment and, you know, working on handbooks and, and all of that, uh, it was continually building that relational, uh, collateral, um, bringing them into our lives more regularly them bringing us into their lives personally as well. Um, and, uh, and making that, making it a, an actual part of, of who we are, not just people that, you know, vote at a meeting together. Um, so all of that, you know, those meetings were highly relational, you know, at moments, obviously there were, there was tension and, and arguments never, you know, which, which comes with anything that anybody's passionate about. Um, but always, uh, as my, uh, one of our partners shares is, uh, unconditional positivity or unconditional positive regard, um, uh, is how, uh, us four partners treat each other. You know, we can be mad at each other. Sometimes we can be frustrated. We can be, you know, irritated or, or whatever, but, uh, we have an unconditional positive regard when it comes to, the character of, uh, of our partners together, the personality, how they handle things, um, uh, always handled in that way. Um, and I think that's, what's continued to help us, um, be set up for solid success. Um, and then obviously, you know, one of the very first things that we did, uh, was, uh, talk with all four of us together about what's our mission statement. 
uh, what's our values, our value, uh, set up and what's, uh, sort of our vision for, uh, the future and, and, and where we want to go. Uh, cause we really wanted, uh, the why to be at the center of what we were doing as a company, um, and not, not let that, um, uh, be dictated by, you know, what was happening around us or our success level or, um, or any of that, always keeping an eye on, on where we wanted to go. Um, and understanding, you know, from my perspective, understanding that, that that mission statement and vision statement and all of that is probably going to be different than it was when, um, when it was just me involved or, or just, uh, uh, just early on. Uh, but we've had the opportunity to bring on two, uh, uh, two perspectives now to be able to have four perspectives together, um, that can really develop a great mission. But, uh, we hear that all the time from our staff that, um, the mission, uh, and vision, uh, drives everything that we do. Um, and we try to continue to do that. You know, we try to keep that at, at the front, um, at the front of who we are and what we do. So what is that? Uh, the, the mission statement, I've got a, um, think through it verbatim, but, um, I usually cheat cause it's on our, uh, on our walls, uh, <laughs> yeah. which is, which is funny. Uh, but yeah, we, we tend to, to stick heavily to our, um, our values, uh, which is obviously the, um, you know, almost tactical side of our mission statement. But, um, you know, we welcome, we educate, we give, we stand out and we have fun. Uh, those are our, our five sets of values. Um, uh, and, uh, and that really drives a lot of what we do, uh, our core values. Uh, we've always tried to stand out in a big way and uh, doing things differently and outside of the norm. Uh, we love to have fun together as, as partners, as well as, as a team, uh, education was a huge part of my life, uh, as a, as a coffee novice, um, not traditionally, you know, working professionally in coffee. I had to really, uh, learn and educate there. So giant part of who we are, um, and we heavily believe, and I think this is a little bit driven by, uh, maybe not always feeling included, um, but, uh, we believe that we welcome is a huge thing, uh, that, that drives us as well. Um, we want every person, every single person that we interact with, whether they're online or, a or a wholesale partner or a retail customer, we want them to feel like, uh, when they interact with us, they feel at home and they feel like they deserve to, to, uh, be a part of what we're doing just merely because they're human, uh, and, and no other reason, uh, but because, uh, that's what everybody deserves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we give, uh, we have a set of strategic partners that we partner with, uh, every year. And those are, those fluctuate and change, but, uh, giving and generosity is huge for us. So, uh, partnering in things, uh, we still do it in a really strategic way because we want to make a big impact. Um, but, uh, we make sure to keep that at the front of our mind with, uh, whether it be staff, uh, or, um, uh, our community people or partners or, or, or things like that around us, uh, we want to be known as uh, generosity being at, at the forefront uh, without without necessarily being a, a nonprofit organization, uh, but uh, being a for profit organization that still believes in uh, in that generosity. So great. Um, yeah. You know, when you're thinking about, you know, how to actualize that mission statement in yeah. the current you know form that your company is in. Uh, what does, cause I want to get back to the, like how you decide to move forward by putting yeah. into place, uh, a shop and yeah, a roaster yeah, yeah. machines and mm-hmm. your staff and the, the operational, uh, complexities that come with scaling to the degree that you did sure. with partners. So uh, there's some growing pains, I'm sure that, oh, yeah. that you went through. So I guess the, the question would be. First, of course, you know, how do you decide what's appropriate? And second, and so now that, you, you know, we're uh, obviously one of, one of the things here that I'm, I'm thinking about as you're talking about that is that for, you know, many, you know, I'd say many, all coffee bars need to have 
consistency in communication is one of the core things that you know, defines whether or not the employees feel cared for and the customers also see the care and feel cared for themselves. So the, what you're describing and actualizing these things with your staff is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, and you mentioned earlier, you were talking about, um, you, you know, when I said there was uh, growing pains in, you know, as you're becoming a larger company, I wonder if you could elaborate on that you know, and, and talk a little bit about what those were and um, how, how you dealt with the growing pains of matching yourself to a growing mm-hmm. business. And then practically speaking, I guess we'll you know, make it a two-part question, but yeah. uh, practically speaking, when you're uh, deciding w- what to do, you can bite off more than you can chew with, you know, oh, yeah. invested capital you know, how did, how did that look? Because those are two yep. things that I, I think would be intimidating for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, I go back to those initial partners meetings that we had when we were beginning the company and, um, you know, this idea of consistent communication, um, and contis- consistently talking through, you know, what, what we're wrestling with or struggling with. And, uh, the great and amazing part about our partnership team is that we have four individuals that, uh, early on we sort of identified, you know, okay, here's our sweet spots, um, as far as what, uh, what we want to, you know, individually run after and we, where we feel like our skill sets can best be used. Um, and then, you know, we'll come together each month and, and discuss, you know, are there any areas that we need to overlap so that, you know, we can, we can consistently help, uh, each other. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, a lot of that comes from, uh, asking for help, uh, from your partners or, uh, or asking from asking for help from other people in the industry, um, looking for resources and being, uh, humble. I think that, uh, that was a huge piece for us. Um, you know, we spent a good amount of time, you know, researching and reading and looking through things, uh, because we had never, you know, built a, an employee handbook before. Um, we had never, you know, put together an onboarding process, uh, or a hiring process. Uh, and we never, you know, uh, went to the bank for, for high level funding. Um, and, uh, so we learned a lot, obviously trial by fire, by just, you know, all of us saying, yep, this is how we're going to run with it. And, and we trust each other. Um, and you know, we'll learn from, from any of mistakes that we make, but, uh, this is how we're going to go. Uh, but we did realize that, uh, there's a lot of room. We left a lot of room for trying. Uh, we left a lot of room for trial and error. Uh, and we continually do that. You know, we, we still leave room, uh, to try things, uh, cause there's always new, uh, new things that happen or new things that we run into that, um, we didn't really know how to handle before, but, um, it's, uh, it's using resources, uh, like, uh, friends in the industry, uh, or, uh, maybe past experiences. You know, I mentioned that I, I helped to manage, um, this, uh, this cafe, or I helped to manage this, uh, uh, retail store before. Um, and, uh, a lot of those logistical policies, uh, and procedures, you know, we transitioned into, into some of these policies and procedures as well, uh, that we use, um, in our cafe and in our company now. So, um, none of that knowledge is, um, you know, all of that stuff really helped to develop and build into, to, into where we are now. Um, but we owe a lot to, uh, the other people, uh, in the industry that were willing to sit down with us and talk, uh, or other people, like I mentioned, uh, the breweries we've partnered with or, um, you know, other wholesale vendors of ours that we've used in the past, um, you know, their willingness to wrestle through some questions we might have, um, is great. Uh, and we've always been, uh, highly humble thinking that, you know, we don't know all the answers, uh, but we have to try, uh, mm-hmm. we know where, you know, we know where we want to be. Um, and, uh, and so continually adjusting and adapting to that is great. Um, and, uh, you know, continually learning. I, I mentioned to you and we were uh, recording before that, uh, 
that I had never steamed milk before um, until I went to pick up my espresso machine uh, when it was ordered <laughs> and uh, played it pretty low key. Like I knew exactly what I was doing. Um, but yeah, never, never really steamed milk before. I, I understood it conceptually and the idea. Um, but you know, I'm the director of coffee and co-owner at ICR, you know, you'd think that I would know how to do that. Um, but, uh, I didn't. So best way to do that is to buy yourself an amazing piece of equipment, install it and, uh, get to work, uh, practicing. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's that fine balance of, uh, having a really high uh, level of self-awareness, understanding that, you know, every day I wake up, uh, and every day all of our partners wake up, we're going to give our best and we're going to try, uh, and, and doing our best is all we expect. You know, I don't expect, um, any of our partners to know exactly what to do, no matter what, what happens. Um, because, uh, there's all these curveballs that happen. Um, but I do expect, and we all four of us keep ourselves or hold each other accountable to this idea that we're going to wake up every day and try our hardest, um, and do the best we can. And, um, you know, at that point it was, you know, let me just try to steam milk without spraying everywhere. Um, but at this point it looks a little bit differently. So, um, uh, that continual self-awareness and knowing that, you know, it's okay to not have all the answers and, uh, and it's really important to lean on each other. So, yeah, yeah, you're a very good point. You know, there's a lot of resources in the community and a lot of people try to go it alone Yeah, and they, you know, can't admit when they need help. And in yeah. some degree, you know, that's, um, something that I think the industry, promotes in in, yeah, in some sometimes. ways with with uh, i don't necessarily think only celebrity coffee culture but yeah the brave entrepreneur and um the all the all-seeing eye of the owner and you know just i i, I think that's a great tack to take and then um when you're when you're taking on all of this um extra work you know you're not doing it alone it's it's helpful to yep. have a, a team with you yeah um when you started the cafe and you're st and you're dealing with the selection of the equipment, um, yep. and the staffing, what would you say the most helpful thing uh, was that you did in order to make the right practical decisions? Be, you know, yeah. in, in that you took that fifty dollars seed money when you first started. Yeah. <laughs> now you've got a much bigger mo amount of money that you've got yep. to turn around, and you could yep. biff it, you know. So how did you not biff it? <laughs> <laughs> well, we did a little bit, obviously. Everybody everybody swings and misses sometimes, uh, but we hope to not swing and miss uh, more than we more than we hit. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that you know, just practically, a lot of the way that we did it, you know, uh, we sat down as a team of four, and and uh, specifically, uh, or sort of the way we have it structured is. Uh, one of our partners is director of retail. Uh, I'm director of coffee. Um, our another one is director of operations, and then our our fourth one is director of brand and marketing, which I already already had mentioned. Um, so when we were launching, we all sort of had our own avenues that we were were running down. Uh, operations, obviously, continually securing funding and and working through that. What does you know payroll look like? What does payment processing? You know bank accounts, all of that stuff. Um, and then uh, our brand and marketing. You know, how do we how do we market this new space, uh, develop a brand for all these assets uh, that go into play? How do we market a retail space opening, you know, packaging, all of that? Um, but our retail director of retail and I um, started really with the menu uh, uh, as far as when we were thinking through equipment. We said, OK, let's back all the way back up and say, what do we want to have on our menu? Uh, and we backed up even further and said, According to our values and our mission statement, which we had, you know, adapted according to that, what would those values have on a menu uh, in a retail environment? Um, you know, so for us, um, our aesthetic and our brand is very much minimal, clean, back to the basics, bring, make things simple um, and, and really let the coffee shine. 
so that drove a lot of our menu development uh, to say, you know, we're going to make simple drip coffee, manual brew coffee, simple, um, you know, tea based stuff, uh, simple espresso and milk based drinks, uh, you know, all very much back to the basics. So uh, with all of that, we said, OK, we need a, a an amazing piece of espresso equipment that uh, is also for us. Uh, going to give an opportunity for our baristas to speak into the, the customers, speak to uh, people, have that uh, blend of the bar just blending straight into the cafe. Um, so that was why we chose Mod Bar, not only because it's aesthetically pleasing, but because it's locally made in Fort Wayne, so uh, committed to our community, but also um, it had the amazing marriage of if we want people to have fun and see what we're doing, if we want to stand out and we want to educate our customers, then they've got to be able to see how um, how the espresso is made. So that was uh, that was a lot of why practically we chose that. Um, and then, you know, obviously continually learning more that that they make really great equipment and pulls amazing shots of espresso. Um, and then that just continually transitioned down into uh, the rest of the retail environment, you know, I know we, we had mentioned the values before, but, um, all of that stuff just sort of blends back into that. We say, you know, we built the bar the way we did, uh, at our space so that customers could come and interact with us. It was very open air, uh, and available and, and everything's really on display, um, as well as, um, uh, even smaller aspects like we want to give and we want to serve really well. So, um, you know, we we take every drink out to all of our customers at our retail space uh, and we pick up dishes for them. There is no dish bin. Um, we uh, we make a point to, to come around to the table and bust the tables. Uh, and that's our continual way to give back, continual way to serve them. Um, so it's just some of those uh, little practical steps that uh, for us. Uh, and this is what I share a lot with our wholesale partners. Uh, if they if they bring us on early enough is, uh, is I always say, well, what do you want to, you know, what do you want to serve on your menu? Um, what are, what are the things that, that your company would serve on a menu if, if that was it? Um, and, uh, and that's where then I can help them decide, okay, well, you know, if you're going to be heavily espresso heavy, you know, you want at least a two group machine or, or, or bigger. Um, if you're going to be more pour over heavy or manual brew heavy, maybe you want some different methods for that or a larger space on your bar to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, all of that really just sort of dictated by, you know, what do we, what do we want to serve our customers? And, and then we say, okay, well, let's, let's research, uh, you know, the best thing we can and the price point that we have and, and, uh, and go from there. Um, we, I, I'm a little bit of a gear nerd, so, um, I, uh, I'm fairly familiar with, with the vendors that we use now, um, fellow products and, uh, uh, Mod Bar and, um, now, now La Marzocco with Mod Bar as well as, uh, Wilbur Curtis and, and everything they do. So, um, all of those things were, um, were just pieces that we were like, okay, now let's sort of, let's sort of build it together and, and figure out what we need to make that happen. Yeah, I imagine the roaster is in a similar vein, although a little bit more oh, yeah. personal for you. Yep. Yeah, the roaster, uh, and that's, and we're in a very unique spot with that. So um, I had the opportunity after the Royal uh, Number no. Five uh, to be able to roast on a San Franciscan Six, which is a SF Six six pound uh, roaster. Uh, it gave me the upgraded ability to, while before we were open, the ability to uh, roast six pound batches uh, really consistently because I had control over uh, gas and airflow and stuff like that. Um, so, and I always sort of loved the San Francisco, San Franciscan idea. They're still very manual oriented, um, still very much, um, you got to be one with the machine, uh, not very technically advanced. Um, and so when we were looking for a roaster, we were pretty dead set on the SF 25. Um, and, uh, so started to research that we're pretty close to, to, uh, to putting our name in to order one. Uh, and, uh, and then we, we did one last effort on eBay to search around like, Hey, maybe somebody's got an old roaster that they want to get rid of. Uh, and we came across an SF 25, 
Uh, it was number 37 that they built as a company. Uh, it was at a great price point, um, all the way in, uh, in Lake Tahoe. Uh, and, uh, and what we come to find out was the guy that sold us to it, sold us, uh, the roaster, uh, drove it all the way out here on his, uh, on his pickup truck. And, uh, there's some pictures if you scroll all the way down on our Instagram, way deep in there, uh, of me, uh, driving a, uh, a forklift for the first time, uh, getting that, uh, that coffee roaster off the, uh, off the truck, nice. uh, which was an, which was an adventure in its own. No, I am not a licensed forklift operator. Um, so I don't suggest it. Um, I'm not available for contract. Um, <laughs> but, uh, again, one of those, show notes. yeah, one of those things that, uh, you know, they were like, well, you need a forklift to get it off like, okay, well, I'm going to go down the road and rent one and, and, uh, and hope I don't drop the roaster. And luckily I didn't. And, uh, but yeah, we, uh, very old school. Uh, we, we had it repainted uh, to sort of match our aesthetic and, and color. And, uh, and it's a labor of love, you know, a used machine that's, uh, got its quirks and, and all of that. Um, but it, it obviously is, is a, a big core of our business. So, uh, we try to treat it right, uh, show it some love and, uh, and take care of it. So sweet, man, so much is happening <laughs> and yeah, has happened. Right. Um, yep. and, uh, your approach to all the transition I think is so healthy and yeah. your relationships with your partners, especially is a, uh, it sounds like a great example. Um, I wonder as we wrap up here, yeah. What would you say your advice would be to um, entrepreneurs who are getting ready to scale their business, they're planning yeah. on it? From your experience, what kind of things should they be focusing on and be prepared for uh, to do it the right way? Yeah. Um, I think a couple things. Um, we mentioned it before already, but uh, self awareness is huge. Um, and self-awareness in a way of, of self-care. I know self-care is sort of like the, uh, the cool thing to talk about right now. It feels like, uh, in culture, but which is great. Um, but having that self-awareness to know, okay, it's time to rest. Okay. I don't need to, you know, uh, I don't need to go to every single event. I don't need to, um, you know, I don't need to devalue time with my family in order to grow the business. Um, it's all about, um, not even prioritizing, but just valuing what you value and understanding that the, the scale at which you can grow, uh, is only good if, if you can handle that, that speed. So, uh, be okay with that self-awareness and, you know, have other people in your life that can speak into that. Um, whether it be your partners or people outside of, you know, the business as a whole. Um, and then the other side is, uh, is really just, um, understanding that you don't have all the answers. Um, I continually, uh, I think we talked about it a little bit when we were recording, uh, our, our episode, but, but saying, uh, you know, I'm continually working myself out of a job. I can, I'm continually, um, you know, doing a job that uh, I don't know all the answers to. Um, but I know that, uh, again, we're going to try our hardest and do our best. And that's what, uh, that's all we can ask. Uh, and we have to believe in each other. So, uh, believing in yourself and believing in each other, uh, and giving yourself a long leash, uh, is important. Uh, especially for those that are owners, you know, if you're, if you're an owner and an entrepreneur that that's sort of running the ship, um, you know, you're the captain. So you're, uh, you're in charge of burnout, you know, you're in charge of, uh, if you get burnt out or if your staff is burnt out or, you know, you can make that change. Um, your, your business doesn't run you, uh, you know, you run the business. Uh, and, uh, so understanding that, you know, whatever you got to do to, to put some of that in play is fine. And, um, you know, if you can't be open on Mondays and Tuesdays cause you need to rest, then, you know, understand, yeah, you know, you may lose some sales, but is that more important than, uh, than, uh, than what that looks like? And so for us, that's, what's really helped uh, us focusing on here's the pace that, that we can all handle together. Here's the pace that our staff can handle. 
Uh, here's the speed, always continually pushing and growing together, but uh, being understanding and, and communicating that and saying, okay, that means that, you know, we're only going to do this amount of events because that's all we can handle or, you know, and we understand that that means that we won't grow as quickly, but that's okay. You know, all of that's fine. And, um, for whatever reason with entrepreneurs and, and even in the coffee space, obviously there's a race right now to, uh, to build something. Um, but for us, we want to build something that's, you know, a staple in the industry for 50, 60 years. You know, I want, I want my son to have, you know, the opportunity to, uh, grow the business if he wants to, you know, into his thirties and forties. Um, uh, not just something that, you know, we ran hard after this for five years and, and got burnt out and quit, you know, um, you know, we're, we're building a legacy, uh, and the legacies take a long time. Um, uh, and, uh, they may not always be the trendy thing, but, um, that's what I would encourage you to do is, um, build something bigger than, uh, definitely build something bigger than, than just yourself. But, um, cause it's a lot more rewarding to do that than, uh, than anything else. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that practical stuff is just super important. Just continually being in tune with yourself and saying, what can I handle? What can I do? And asking your staff the same thing, you know, what pace can you handle? What can you do? And it's okay, you know, to, to run at whatever pace is, is, uh, is good for you. So mm, and, and that necessarily, and that means sometimes letting go of control. Oh uh, yeah. You just mentioned working yourself out of a job, which, yep. you know, you, obviously you're not doing the same things in the company now that you used to nope. do. No. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, like, uh, like again, at the beginning, you know, we transitioned into bringing in four partners, which means that, you know, now we split those responsibilities in four and then, you know, we opened our cafe in, in 2018 and, and brought on 12 people. And, you know, I wasn't, you know, I'm not the primary manager or none of our owners are, um, and then transitioned into me not roasting full time anymore. And, uh, you know, I just helped to manage, uh, uh, manage our, uh, production manager who's in charge of all of that. And we're getting ready to, uh, for him to grow and transition into that management role and, and start to teach someone else to, or a team of people to help, uh, roast. And so, um, all of those benchmarks, again, you, you got to be passionate about your company as a whole uh, and what you can accomplish and your values and your mission, not the tactical stuff that you do. Uh, because God willing, with success and whatnot, uh, you won't be doing the same stuff. Um, and, uh, and so if you only find value from the current things that you're doing, uh, your self-esteem is going to go down when you've got to give that up. Or you won't give it up, uh, and you'll uh, you'll stifle growth, and um, your company will only grow as far as you can take it. Um, you know we're we're ten times uh, a better roasting company now because of that transition we've made um, to the to the person involved uh, now on our production team than when I was doing it, um, just because his passion and focus is there. Uh, my passion and focus is. Um, is involved in a lot of things, uh, because of, uh, the position that I have. So, um, that's what I get psyched about. And, and it's always, it's always super rad to, to see someone else succeed that you've helped to, to grow and teach, uh, than you do it yourself. So, um, don't, uh, don't get too, uh, don't romanticize too much the current gig that you have because, um, uh, you'll either, no longer be able to do it or, uh, or your uh, business will grow and, and they won't need you to do it anymore. So, yeah, excellent. Yes. Yes. Great advice. Um, well, this has really been fun and I sure. appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing your journey with the audience here at keys to the shop. Um, so many of which are on the cusp of, or right in the middle of these types of moments. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, how can we stay in touch with all that you've got going on and yeah. uh, up to date with what's in store in the future? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, following us on, on all social platforms at Indie Coffee Roasters. Uh, we also, as far as some practical knowledge and all that stuff, uh, we're posting on our blog regularly. 
uh, with uh, both consumer facing stuff as well as uh, business facing things. So uh, things that we've learned uh, in our in our uh, life uh, and and life of the business. Uh, so if you have questions there, uh, that's an awesome resource uh, too. Um, as well as, uh, like we mentioned, uh, we had the opportunity to chat with you on our podcast, uh, all very centered on helping other businesses grow together. Um, so a wide open book there, um, to, to learn more, um, and, uh, feel free to, uh, uh, to fill out the form on our website. Uh, if you do have, you know, you just want to connect as another business, you know, maybe you're a, you know, roaster and you're trying to learn as well. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're very open to continually growing and developing that partnership. And, um, and we want, we want the coffee industry to be synonymous with community, not, uh, with doing things in a silo. So, um, however we can help with that, we will. Awesome. So many great places to go, uh, great sure. resources too. So the website and, uh, definitely subscribe to the podcast there. Mm-hmm. So Alec, thank you again. It's been a great to talk to you. Yeah, no problem. And, uh, we always love, uh, being able to chat with you guys. Well, a huge thanks again to Alec Todd of Indie Coffee Roasters for, joining us on the show. I love the discussion about, you know, life in the transition points of um, growing a business. All of this is so fresh uh, for indie coffee roasters. Uh, They're doing great things in Indianapolis. And I think one of the things for me in this episode that was really a great takeaway was the spirit with which I think uh, these growth points in their company were pursued in that spirit of having a measured approach that's relational and uh, others focused where you can see in their values there are very others focused and that kind of helps guide what could easily be something that gets out of hand and uh, very intimidating by sharing ownership you're also sharing risk and sharing risk, you're also um, gaining safety, and you're gaining safety in the fact that you have other pre- people's perspectives, and that can keep you humble as well. As you know, he discussed the times when they are not always in agreement, and it's not always um, smooth sailing, but they make it work, and they value each other, and they live by the values of their business. Um, Uh, So uh, I'm really glad to hear this as sort of a theme throughout this discussion. And I hope that you gained a lot of insights from uh, Alex's journey in in the coffee roasters as well. Again, if you want to keep up to date with them, you can follow them on Instagram or any social platform, really. It's Indy with an IE, not a Y. It's Indy Coffee Roasters uh, on Instagram, Twitter, etc., you can visit their website, IndieCoffeeRoasters.com, and also their podcast that Alec hosts um, that I was just recently a guest on is Coffee Unleashed. Go and subscribe to that as well. Now, if you want to reach out to me, you can do so by emailing Chris at KeysToTheShop.com. Uh, if you have questions, comments, feedback, or you want to inquire about working with Keys to the Shop consulting or training for your business, that is the email to do so. Chris at Keys to the Shop.com. Also, I would encourage you to sign up over at Keys to the Shop.com to be on the Keys to the Shop mailing list where you will get the transcript of every episode, as well as bonus audio, resources, news about Keys to the Shop, and other cool stuff. So again, Keys to the Shop.com, all you have to do is scroll down to the bottom of the page, put your information in, and you'll be signed up to receive that. Now, here's an announcement for you. Tacoma, Washington Coffee Fest is having a fourth show this year. Uh, the brand new two-day show on November 15th and 16th in Tacoma. So if any of you are in the area and want to take part in this two-day event that is bound to just deliver a ton of value to you and your business, Coffee Fest is by far the best trade show or conference that you could go to as a coffee retailer. So much value, so much free information and affordable classes and workshops uh, and great community as well. Go to coffeefest.com to learn more about this show. 
coming up in Tacoma, Washington, November 15th through the 16th. Of course, I will be there judging latte art and giving some talks, and I hope to uh, meet some of you on the show floor as well. So that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for joining me. And again, thank you to Alec Todd for being our guest. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>